All right, so we'll get rolling right away here. So uh, thank you. Uh, in light of the recycling information reported out in the first part of this agenda topic, uh, administration would be remiss to not talk about ways we are looking at to mitigate the resulting impacts through the broader alternative servicing initiative that is part of the corporate business plan supporting council's strategic plan. Our goal is to make the, the recycling impacts that you're hearing about here tonight, uh, specifically landfilling of many things that we've recycled in the past, be a short-term thing. Uh, waste management has been a component of the alternative servicing initiative since its conception. So the outline for the presentation to inform council and the public is before you. It's really meant to explain the why uh, behind the alternative servicing initiative, including recycling. So we're going to talk briefly about what we're trying to accomplish. So waste minimization, including our recycling program just discussed, is a subset of the alternative servicing initiative. We are here today to inform on what steps we are taking with our recycling in light of the current information provided and resultant impact service levels. However, for next steps, the whole story needs to be told and all the facts and issues need to be considered. Recycling alone cannot be discussed as we are taking an integrated utilities approach in our work with interlinkages between our different commodities and wastes and utilizing them as economic drivers while also addressing the associated environmental and social responsibilities concurrently. We do have some of the highest servicing costs in the region, which disincents development investment. There are no ways to make the offsite levies associated with these cheaper with traditional methods. So we are looking at alternative methods of servicing, which provide opportunities to reduce servicing costs to improve our competitiveness in attracting development, but also to attract new business to our community through an enhanced value proposition, integrating both technologies and processes and smart city concepts, which includes advanced waste minimization strategies. Hand in hand with reduced servicing costs, alternative servicing generates new revenue opportunities, including new utility services, such as non-potable water, heat and electricity, and different taxation rates for different businesses. Next, we'll talk about the drivers that are uh, uh, for alternative servicing. So this doesn't show up very well, <laughs> but it, uh, this is a bit of a preview of what council and the community will be seeing at the start of the budget season in late October. So I do have to put a bit of a caveat on this. Some of these numbers may change, but we're not expecting any, any drastic changes between now and then. Um, you know, given we can't see the numbers, the two, the three key rows are the, the two green rows and the red rows, and I'll give you a verbal explanation of what that's saying. What it basically tells us is that overall we have a $341 million uh, deficit in our growth plan <clears throat> over the next 10 years with available average growth project funds of approximately 8.4 million years each year on the assumption all repair, maintain, and replace capital projects are funded. So if we just put that relative to the cost of the transportation projects we were just talking about, which are growth projects, and they're more than $8.5 million a year. It is worth noting that aging infrastructure is a significant issue across Canada. Communities are struggling to find RMR funds, and we'll be depleting our RMR reserves to undertake the RMR projects we need to. This also doesn't include the operations portion of the budget, which going ahead, at minimum, will have inflationary increases, assuming inflation is experienced. We have been making slow but steady progress on our tax ratio over the last 10 years, the ratio between our residential and non-residential, and we've pretty much met the targets set. While this is moving us in the right direction, we are still amongst the communities most highly leveraged on residential taxes. I can only think of one in the region that is worse off. While we are making progress, it is not at quick enough pace to solve the looming financial issues the city faces. And the next question is, are we attracting the right non-residential segment, or are there other segments that have better tax rates and or provide additional revenue opportunities to the city? These are the options we have to tackle this problem. Some are more attractive than others. Taxes and rate increases are always an option. The question is, how much are our taxpayers and rate payers as a whole willing to bear? I hear some taxpayers say they are okay with taxes and would pay more to keep the quality of life. I hear some taxpayers say no tax increase is acceptable. Perhaps we should adhere to what our resident engagement survey says, uh, that residents want the same or more services, but they don't want to pay more taxes. 
To achieve this, we need to bring in more revenues where the incremental revenues are more than the associated costs to realize any appreciable difference from the current situation. Council can choose to forego needed and wanted capital projects, which to a degree is the current reality presented on the previous slides. We can look for cost efficiencies and administration has put significant effort, effort into this to prepare the upcoming proposed budget. Priority based budgeting coming in future budgets as directed by Council will enhance these efforts. Given the current state and the projected future, our focus should be on cost efficiencies, recognizing this is in progress, and noting that it will not solve the long-term financial sustainability of the city by itself. So therefore, it should also be on finding incremental revenue opportunities through enabling new non-residential taxation opportunities and new non-traditional revenue generation opportunities, emphasis on new in both of these instances. So now we're gonna talk about the environment drivers. St. Albert's worst waste diversion rate is commendable. 65 to 70 percent is the upper limit of diversion achievable with current technologies and methodologies, respecting the law of diminishing returns. Basically, for each incremental unit of waste diverted, there is an associated incremental cost per unit. These are entirely hypothetical numbers for illustration, but let's say we are at $10 per unit diverted now. Diverting another unit will cost us $11, and diverting the unit after that will cost us $12. The reality is, given the information presented earlier this evening, we will have trouble maintaining our current diversion rate, let alone improving it. There is a likelihood we may see our waste diversion decline with current circumstances. Assuming things were status quo and we do not find ourselves in the situation just reported, to meet the current diversion goal of 75%, we are counting on increased resi resident participation and effort to sort waste. It's really not in our control and requires us to ask more of our residents. So it is questionable as to whether we would be meeting this goal without significant education and more importantly enforcement, at increased cost, continuing to do things the way we have always done them. The law of diminishing returns will kick in to get higher diversion rates if we keep doing things the same way. In fact, there's a good chance the law of diminishing returns will kick in just to maintain our current diversion rate in light of the circumstances reported this evening. I'm only going to briefly talk about water conservation, uh, one of the other community environmental goals that is at risk, as it will be tackled predominantly by other parts of the integrated processes. Um, but there have been some significant improvements, and this is impressive. But the question is, will we be able to meet the final reductions to meet the target, and how will we do this? Similar to waste diversion, the goal, this, to meet this goal will require heavy education and likely heavier enforcement on our residents at increased cost. The law of diminishing returns will kick in again to get better performance. Or we can implement water reuse initiatives, targeting reduced servicing costs, but also providing water conservation benefits. And finally, there is our community greenhouse gas emissions reduction goal. As shown, we are headed in the wrong direction on this. We'll talk more about greenhouse gas reduction opportunities later in the presentation, but let's talk about recycling a tin can for a moment here. And we're going to talk about recycling a tin can, conserving water, and reducing greenhouse gases at once as a small example of the interdependency of these three community goals and associated strategies on each other. So right now to recycle a soup can, how much water do you use to wash the can? This is potable water. Potable water requires treatment chemical. Energy from fossil fuels is required to produce the treatment chemical. Energy from fossil fuels is required to pump the water out of the river and to combine the chem chemical along with other treatment processes such as filtration and ultraviolet disinfection to produce potable water. Energy from fossil fuels is required in the transmission system pumps to get the potable water from Edmonton to St. Albert. Energy from fossil fuels is required in the distribution system in St. Albert to get it from our reservoirs to your home. Energy from fossil fuels is required to pump the water you use to wash the can to Fort Saskatchewan for treatment. And guess what? That requires energy from fossil fuels before the water is released back to the environment. With a waste recovery process, which we will define later, you don't wash the can out using potable water anymore. You throw it in the garbage. The residual food, which was mentioned quite a bit earlier in the presentation, is converted to green energy by a waste to energy process that uses uh, green energy in the first place to fire it, and the can is still recycled post-process. We're not stopping recycling with the things we're looking at. But we'll talk more about that later. The residual food in the can is from the natural carbon cycle. No harm, no foul to, car to climate change if it is used as energy. Water is conserved and greenhouse gas emissions are minimized. This is how alternative servicing has to be looked at. 
What process has the best net environmental effect when all environmental impacts of the way we handle a waste, its air impacts, its land impacts, and its water impacts are considered? So I, talked, I just talked about net environmental effects in the last slide, the consideration of all environmental impacts and decision making. Unfortunately, we believe some of St. Albert's recycling has been a part of the situation I'm about to show you, which is believed to have been a factor in China's decision to severely limit recyclables from other countries. Socially, the food chain, including humans, is being impacted by these activities, affecting the long-term health of human beings. The entire video is about 26 minutes long. The link is provided, and it's quite compelling uh, viewing to highlight the lack of social and environmental responsibility that has been taken in recycling. I'm not going to show the whole video, but we'll just show a few <laughs> clips here. in California. show briefly what's happening when it gets over there. to figure out what type of plastic it is. Thank uh -huh. 
بین جنسی هست فقط که بود یک که Those are typically used for medical waste. Wow, we definitely don't see that over here. I mean, what we see, but we don't see, you know, material sitting in water or any runoff being discarded in a river. We don't see any plastics burning. We don't see any of the, uh, regional health effects. Now we actually see the material going to a location where people are manually sifting through it. So the whole toxic fish and, you know, bathing the rinse water, that, wow. I don't think that would fly very far. But, and right away, this film is going to have a lot of material that we need to see because we know that plastics are toxic. But wow, to actually sit there and listen to, you know, people are actually going through that. Thing. What can what can we do about it if the government is not gonna not gonna help? Yeah, I think the I think everybody needs to see it. Otherwise, uh, without that, or how far can we get? <laughs> All right. So now we have another video, similar, a uh, little different perspective though. This is a 45 minute video from the UK that uh, tracks recyclables and looks more at the industry side, how it's managed after initial processing and sorting. You'll see in this one of the solution, uh, suggested solution is finding other third world countries that will receive it uh, because China doesn't take it anymore, which is not socially nor environmentally responsible in light of the experience uh, with recyclables going to China. Um, you know, you'll see them suggesting Thailand here, but there was a Reuters news article two weeks ago that Thailand uh, is uh, banning electronic waste imports and within two years they'll be banning uh, plastics as well. And then it's their neighbor, uh, a few weeks ago Vietnam has uh, not issuing any new more, uh, any new permits for importing of uh, recyclables and waste. So, um, you may not, not a socially responsible solution, but it's not even being permitted anymore. The other suggestion you'll see in this is that recyclables be processed domestically. Countries have been losing competitiveness and exporting value, and when processing them locally, we know where our recyclables are going. Absolutely astonishing. I never thought we would 
see this it's sitting here doing nothing. We've seen a lot more publicity, more, more people know that they want to recycle. And that they get very frustrated when they can't. But they don't know where it goes. There's always this assumption that it will be being reprocessed and made into good things in the UK. But frequently it's not. Because it's easier and it's been way cheaper uh, to put it into a container and send it through Hong Kong into China. That's a decision of um, let's, let's pass it on to someone else and then not worry about it. From the business point of view, you say, well, why not? Government equally is, is moving the problem away. It's still achieving our recycling targets that have been set, but it's maybe at somebody else's expense. Just try and sum up to me what our policy in the UK is. The big question now. Kind of either but you just need a country that's willing to take off course. Yes. And that's the problem. Yes, to put hope for that. To turn back into values. This is now the world's bottleneck for plastic scrap. Tons of it stuck in limbo. The big question now, where's it all gonna go? Meet the man who's made his fortune in recycling. that's where it was they're looking at Thailand as the next place to send it but again this is video is a little dated and that's uh, not gonna be allowed for much longer I'll try the end of this video here Try new old El Paso advertiser. <laughs> All right, we'll just uh, go back to the PowerPoint. You can, <laughs> the link, the link is there if anybody wants to watch it. No, uh, just for the sake of time, we'll just keep moving here. I think so. So now we'll briefly cover the relevance of waste recovery in the world, in Canada, and in Saint Albert relative to our own approved plans. So Waste Management Inc. is the largest waste management company in North America. This time, six years ago, they were investing in waste to energy and recovery technologies, zero waste type technologies, buying up companies. They felt managing waste with an increased focus on recovery will more than triple their revenues. Fast forward to February of this year, waste management is one of Bill Gates' favorite stocks. So here we have the founder of Microsoft investing in the largest waste management company in North America, which is investing heavily in the recovery sector of the waste minimization triangle. We'll talk about the waste minimization triangle in a few slides. This is solid waste focus, but is applicable to our other commodities as well, water and wastewater. The point is all our commodities are valuable resources that we are currently either price takers on or we give them away to others to benefit from with no shared benefit realized by St. Albert ratepayers. Sweden intends to reach zero waste by 2020 using waste recovery as shown in this video. Thank <laughs> you. 
So even third world countries are doing it. This is 2018 in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. None of the technologies we're looking at are new. What is new is the way we're looking at integrating them in a collaborative ecosystem approach to achieve sustainability inclusive of economic, environmental, and social factors. I'm not necessarily will be sure we'll be considered an innovator if we proceed with this. There are a number of initiatives underway in Canada, but perhaps we will still be a leader. A recent example here in Canada is in Surrey, British Columbia. They just received the Canadian Association of Municipal Administrators Environment Award in May of this year for their integrated biofuel plants. So CAMA is the city manager's equivalent of FCM for elected officials. I use this example instead of similar initiatives in the Maritimes, as I understand a number of members of our council are familiar with these as a result of visits and conversations during the FCM conference in Halifax this past spring. Congratulations to the City of Surrey, B.C., winner of the 2018 CAMA Environment Award in the over 100,000 population category for its Surrey Biofuel Facility, the first fully integrated closed-loop organic waste management system in North America. The facility will divert more than 115,000 tons of residential and commercial organic waste from the landfill producing approximately 120,000 gigajoules of renewable natural gas and 45,000 tons of compost annually. The energy will be used to power the city's waste collection trucks and service vehicles and provide a renewable fuel source for Surrey's District Energy Forum. The facility will be the largest of its kind in North America. It will reduce community greenhouse gas emissions by 49,000 tons per year, completely eliminate Surrey's corporate carbon footprint of 17,000 tons per year, and help Metro Vancouver achieve its regional waste diversion goal of 80% by 2020. The facility was developed as a public-private partnership, P3, with the Government of Canada contributing up to 25% to a maximum of $16.9 million of the capital cost of the facility. The project is now one of P3 Canada's flagship projects. In 20... The rest is just about the engineering of it. So how does this relate to St. Albert's objectives we have discussed earlier? Surrey's municipal carbon footprint is entirely eliminated with 31,000 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent remaining in reductions after that elimination. Surrey can take this balance and uh, its own municipal pr improvements for that matter if they want and realize them as new revenue by selling credits generated in the marketplace. So this is a new non-traditional revenue source available to them that we have talked about or it can take all of these reductions and apply them towards achieving its community greenhouse gas emissions goals, which we have also talked about. 
This is entirely a council's decision, and a council can also decide if they want a little bit of both, some revenue generation and contributions towards reducing the community's environmental gas emissions. In terms of financial sustainability, it received 25% 25, uh, 25 towards the capital cost in the form of a grant from the federal government. Surrey's financial exposure is also limited through a P3 format in which the private sector partner takes on some of the risk as well. So both of these free up capital funds to Surrey to do, for Surrey to do other capital projects that may, they may not be able to do otherwise. And finally, it generates new business opportunities for the private sector, not necessarily just in construction, but also in long-term operations, depending on how the deal is structured. This would not necessarily be bad news in the current Alberta economy of limited construction and rationalization of existing operations. If you refer to these sections of our Smart City Master Plan in more detail and compare this evening's presentation to it, you will find that alternative servicing details are entirely consistent with the Smart City Master Plan, noting that this plan was developed with one of the largest stakeholder engagements in our history. The ideas and systems being tackled are entirely consistent with the plan. For example, District Energy, which has been talked about, and something where Surrey's sending some of their stuff there, uh, is identified as a tactic in strategy D2, sustainable energy solutions. Council and administration, if anything, are putting the applicable plan components on steroids, so to speak, and this is being driven by necessity in response to changing conditions we're talking about here this evening. If there's any risk of consistency with the Smart City Master Plan, it is of actually of going bigger in breadth and depth than outlined in the plan, not about consistency with it. For example, instead of installing renewable energy systems on city facilities and other infrastructure, a current strategy in the plan, some of our infrastructure could become renewable energy systems in themselves. This is pretty straightforward, but as confirmation of alignment in its strategic plan, Council wants to explore innovative environmental and conservation opportunities. To achieve this strategy, administration is responding by exploring integrated green utilities to reduce carbon footprint, reduce servicing costs, and generate revenue. The discussion this evening is entirely consistent with the strategic plan and the corporate business plan, both released publicly in March of this year and rolled out to relevant groups including the Chamber of Commerce, the Econo Economic Development Advisory Board and the Environmental Advisory Committee. So next we'll talk about what we're trying to achieve to meet the overarching object objective. The main thing we want to achieve is to take environmental and social responsibility for the wastes we generate, doing our part to mitigate the current global issues of, of pollution and climate change while looking to provide more economic benefit to all St. Albertans. To, to date, we have not been doing the best job that we can in achieving any of these. The alternative servicing strategy was developed in part due to the macro global scale issues that we've talked about this evening, but also in part to tackle our local financial sustainability and environmental performance issues we've discussed. As a result, we are well positioned to be a leader in contributing to the global macro issues and realizing the new opportunities emerging as a result. We will approach this through a sustainability mindset with the pillars of sustainability being economics, environment and social. All of these pillars must be applied simultaneously and not one pillar in isolation. For example, what may be the best environmental solution may not be the best economic solution. What may be the best economic solution may not be the best environmental solution. Either of these may produce a worse social outcome than the current status quo if nothing changed. It's all about the best overall solution that improves the performance in all the pillars. I'm not going to talk about specific numbers in this slide as this is the output of the net present value or NPV of zero waste versus traditional waste management in another community. Their traditional method is directly comparable to the way St. Albert does it for the most part. There are always a few minor differences between any communities. This net present value was developed over six months by one of the big four management consulting companies in Canada to ensure it was defensible and to quash any allegations of bias by administration. It was also very conservative using a carbon credit value about half of what is trading in the marketplace today and well below the $50, which is the future price set in carbon tax policy. Similar work will be undertaken for St. Albert with part of the funds that Council has approved. The fact of the matter is traditional waste management, the way we do it now, does not make money. It is a money loser with the cost recovered from our ratepayers, the red on the chart here. It is also important to note normally a project in the private sector is not undertaken unless the MPV is greater than zero or not red in this case, as there's no profit in it. 
This is different in the municipal sector. Generally speaking, we provide services that are not profitable, otherwise we wouldn't do it in the first place. The private sector would. Where we have to contract to the private sector, they, take, they have to have a guaranteed profit margin for them to undertake the work. So this is how rates are determined on a cost recovery basis that our rate payers pay. They include a profit margin for any private sector firm we subcontract to. You can see from the large red portion, the NPV for, for traditional waste management practices is highly negative. We recoup this on a cost recovery base from our rate payers. Even if the NPV for zero waste turns out to be negative, still in the red, once we do the study, but it is less negative than the way we do it now, it is worth undertaking the project as the net cost to our rate payers will be less. In essence, they receive better value for the money, their money, and we look at this differently than the private sector as we are not about making a profit. We are about providing the best value to our rate payers to minimize the costs they pay for services. As stated, a reduction in costs and or new revenue directly benefits rate payers. There are also opportunities to use waste products now generated locally to provide further benefit to rate or taxpayers. For example, ash from waste to energy recovery process can be used for bricks, as you saw in the Addis Ababa video, but it also can be used as admixture in non-structural concrete. This lowers concrete costs, so now our sidewalk replacement costs can be lower, or we can do more sidewalk replacements for the same funds approved by Council. Glass, which is no longer being recycled, can also be used as admixture in uh, concrete, uh, as road base, or as foundation bases on new municipal buildings. Helsinki puts their glass in their sidewalks to reuse it and for aesthetic effects. I have served a community that stockpiled their glass for a new municipal building foundation to conserve soil and reduce material costs in the project budget. They began this prior to 2010. I have served another community that stockpiled glass, crushed it, and used it as road base for construction. They began this prior to 2004. Some of this is not new to other communities. Then there is the new revenue, the revenue from greenhouse gas credits from landfill avoidance, the revenue from sales of heat and electricity, the potential sale of byproducts locally, such as plastics and metals. What if we sold our recyclable plastic or gave it away to a business that is locally that is to be established to manufacture plastic lumber or plastic furniture? What would that do for local building costs, local product, no transportation from distance driving up costs, and it would employ labor locally, and the labor employed in the plastic manufacturing would be typical of the changing demographics St. Albert will see with the growth plan implementation. While this slide is focused on economic sustainability, the other pillars, social and environmental, cannot be excluded in decision making. And this is the type of lens that has to be used, a multi-lens when looking at these opportunities. They are not linear, they are cross-sector, cross-demographic, and sustainability oriented. It's not about environment, economics, or social, it's about all of them rolled up. It is also important to note that this net present value only looks at solid waste and the waste minimization triangle. It does not account for integration with other opportunities such as wastewater reuse, district energy, or food production. So let's, so right now let's give this MPV, MPV a value of one for waste, let's say, and district energy, uh, again, a value of one. When you combine these, it is not so much that one plus one equals two for total benefit, but it could be a case that 1.1 equals two and a half or three or four. The compounded value remains to be determined with the work we still have to do. All Climate Local is a scientific American article from 2011. Climate change is a global problem, but to solve it, it has to be solved at the local community level, with each community contributing to the conglomerate of efforts relative to its local opportunities and challenges. I won't go into much more depth on this, but instead we'll focus on how green utilities, which is what we are looking at for alternative servicing, including how we manage our waste, it realizes a new revenue opportunity for municipalities, greenhouse gas credits or carbon credits, in addition to the environmental benefits that generate the credits in the first place. Greenhouse gas credits are pretty much the same as holding shares in the company. They're traded daily and their value fluctuates subject to market conditions. The holder of a credit can decide if and when to sell them. When a credit is generated, it's not an instantaneous transaction. All work going forward would be done at conservative values, representative of free market trading, without counting on a $50 value due to government regulation, to recognize uncertainty in the future with carbon taxes should there be changes in other levels of government in the future. The market has been around for years prior to and independent of government regulations. I should also note that the credits do not have to be sold, but can be used as offsets by a council if carbon neutral is a goal. 
In other words, if a credit is sold, it cannot also be applied towards making a community ne carbon neutral. At the minimum, they could be applied towards the community greenhouse gas emissions goal, which the community is not currently progressing on. Some could also be sold and some kept to balance the community's carbon footprint and revenue generation. We saw that the Surrey Council has a, their choice of any of these options. In St. Albert, people tell me we have a traffic problem, which I'm beginning to agree with now that I've been here for a while. This was discussed earlier this evening. There are many transportation strategies and projects required, and they are being tackled, but this is one more way to minimize some vehicles, particularly heavy vehicles like waste and recycling collection vehicles with high emissions factors, both locally and regionally. The NPV I showed you earlier had 5% of ne revenues netted out of it prior to the NPV calculation. This 5% was to go to a post-secondary institution as sustaining money for them to operate a center of innovation excellence to realize additional revenue from exporting the knowledge gained, as uh, provincial funding was not sufficient for them, as it's not sufficient for any post-secondary institutions. With the current and looming economic issues we see in the news, this situation is likely not to improve. As I understand, there's interest within the community in having post-secondary back here. This may help to get them here and keep them sustainable in the long term so they stay here. Then there's the social profit sector. There's an opportunity to provide the local social profit sector with organic, low-carbon footprint produce for free, with local aquaponics operations receiving green energy from waste to energy. So now they can put monetary donations towards other needs, or likewise residents making donations can purchase other needed goods instead. So how are we going to present solutions to achieve the objective? We need to spend a little bit of time on this slide about waste minimization uh, to make sure there's no confusion about the hierarchy of the waste minimization triangle and to ensure the term zero waste is clearly defined for St. Albert as it has very different opposing definitions used around the world and there are indications of confusion in our community about the strategy as it relates to the triangle. The representation of waste minimization is very common, but often it does not get much thought to what it is actually telling us. So let's start with the waste minim so let's start with how the waste minimization triangle is used. We start at 100% of waste generated by all of us prior to any strategies. If we can reduce waste, the top category there, now there is X percent left left for further handling. Once we reuse the remaining waste, there's Y percent less, which is less than X percent. Then we recycle what we can of the remaining, and Z percent is left, is left, which is less than Y. Currently in St. Albert, Z is about 35 percent after we've reduced, reused, and recycled. So we have looked at the final segment of the 4Rs recovery as a solution to the current situation we find ourselves in, as reported this evening, and to tackle the remaining 35 percent of waste that is not being diverted currently and to address the potential regression in our waste management practices presented this evening. Why not get higher diversion with less effort required from residents and potentially, potentially generate financial benefit for all? Why would we set a goal of 75%, our current goal, and not 100%? That is how we are approaching this issue. Zero waste presents this opportunity, but first we need to define zero waste as it means very different things to people and groups with differing perspectives. The definition of zero waste has evolved significantly in recent years and some streams of thought do not allow recovery into zero waste. San Francisco is an example. They plan to be zero waste by 2020 without recovery. We will see if it can be done. They are at about 80% currently. But it's important to note they have a 100% cost recovery model. Their rate payers pay for this approach to reach zero waste and remember the law of diminishing returns I spoke of. Basically, San Francisco will compromise economics, in this case at the expense of their rate payers, for the environment. Is that sustainable? Time will tell. The question is, is this the right solution for St. Albert when it's viewed through the sustainability lens inclusive of environment, economics, and social, and not looking at one aspect in isolation? Then there's the definition of zero waste as shown in the Swedish model video, where everything goes into the recovery process, even new clothing. This is the opposite end of the zero waste spectrum from San Francisco with, with recovery becoming the major emphasis over the other three R's. This model provides a high degree of economic sustainability but is not the best environmental solution. In an ideal model in which all four R's are employed, the fourth R being recovery, it should not take away from the other three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, but instead it should enhance them. The residual waste is supposed to decline with each subsequent R. So let's talk a little bit about these R's. 
The first one is reduce. We can't really do much for the reduced segment without regulation and consumer buy-in. This is really about packaging and higher levels of government regulating. It can be done, but costs to the consumer will be driven up by the supply chain from producers to retailers, which is why it's not being heavily actioned. Though there is starting to be some development of policy in Europe on this. There are things that be can, can be done locally, such as a single-use bag ban, plastic <coughs> utensils and straw bans, and green procurement policies, which of course come at a premium. <coughs> These are a community contribution, but they alone will not resolve the larger issue, a global issue, and could result in local disparities of costs of goods and services relative to other communities. You may recall notices of motion for single-use plastic utensils and straws, which were put forward but defeated. A motion to implement a single-use bag ban is coming forward for debate this fall. So we as a community are not quite sure yet whether we're ready to take on the reduced giant. For reuse, just an example of some of the options available to us, if glass and tin are now placed in the regula regular garbage to go through the waste to energy process and then are reused or recycled after that process, then perhaps we have the capacity, either as residents or as, a, as the collector, or both, to put more effort into recycling our plastics better by sorting the recyclable plastics and non-recyclable plastics. Recycling can be enhanced by the sorting in the zero waste process to make new products locally, such as plastic lumber or furniture, driving economic growth instead of sending them away internationally with limited control over their disposition, the options for which are very limited at the moment. This process actually increases recycling. Residents that don't voluntarily recycle things like tin cans by now by throwing them in the garbage will be involuntarily recycling as the tin cans will be collected post-process uh, for the post the waste energy process for recycling instead of going into the landfill as is the case now. So what we are looking at for zero waste is somewhere between the Swedish and San Francisco models. We are looking at this with the sustainability lens to provide the best overall solution considering economic, environmental and social aspects. The solution may not be the best overall economic, environmental, or social, but it will be a balanced approach to these aspects, and we will have better performance in all of these aspects than we do now. And solely in the waste minimization sense, we should have better reduce, reuse, and recycling performance than we do now, further enhanced by the employment of recovery. These are the outputs of the type of waste, zero waste process technology we are considering, ash, metals, glass, and green energy, both heat and electricity. The green energy comes, comes from any organics in the waste stream. If you look at the photo, you can see tin cans and glass bottles intact and waiting to be recycled. The ash under the grate can be used for non-structural concrete as discussed. Not much different than what Ethiopia is doing in the video that I showed you. It is green energy because if it is energy derived from anything but fossil fuels or fossil fuel derived products such as plastics, then it is from the natural carbon cycle so it is not impactful and it is renewable. The technologies we are looking at should not be confused with high temperature thermal processes such as incineration or plasma as they have been to date, which produces a slag that still has to be disposed of. In the case of Sweden in the video, the slag was being placed in old mines. Any supplemental energy inputs into the process that may be needed from time to time will also be from green energy sources such as biosolids, the solid component of our sewage or biofuels produced from wastage from agricultural crops or waste vegetable oil derived from these crops. The process won't be fired and maintained by fossil fuels. Why is this better for the environment than landfilling? When waste decomposes over time in a landfill, it produces methane. Methane is 99% of natural gas. Methane is 21 times worse for climate change than carbon dioxide when released to the environment. So thermally processing waste eliminates methane production and instead produces carbon dioxide, reducing the climate change impact of waste by 21 times. And by avoiding landfill gas generation from, from placing waste in the landfill, a new revenue opportunity is realized, carbon credits, which we've already discussed. <coughs> we'll be carefully evaluating waste streams for the process to make decisions on what should go into the process and what shouldn't. An obvious example of what should not go into the process is yard waste, as good Class A compost can be made from it for use by residents on their properties. Plastics are fossil fuel derived, and what should we do with them in light of the information presented this evening? Should we sort plastics into recyclable and non-recyclable and continu continue to recycle those that we can or repurpose them locally? Should we put non-recyclable plastics in the landfill? 
as we will now be doing, at least in the short term, or should we put them in the waste to energy process under controlled engineered parameters to protect the environment as a one-time substitute to extracting more fossil fuels for the energy that would still be in demand, regardless of the source? Should we stockpile our plastics and wait for a third world country to take them? Is this acceptable to St. Albert residents for our social and environmental responsibility? What about cardboard and mixed paper? There's a great market for cardboard and it's relatively easy to separate, so it probably shouldn't go in the waste to energy process. What about mixed paper? It's not as easy to sort and the market isn't as, for it isn't as good. Should we continue to recycle it at a loss or should we put it into the waste to energy process for non-fossil fuel derived energy as a substitute for fossil fuels? What are some of the other things being considered in our evaluation? How can we mitigate impact on the agricultural sector to conserve agricultural lands, increase the effective yields of them, and mitigate their impact on water quality due to the use of fertilizer through integration with alternative servicing? The world is already short of sufficient producing agricultural plan land to sustain the world's current population, and the last time I checked, the world population isn't getting smaller and the world isn't getting bigger. Grants are available for this type of work, as was mentioned in June at Council, the Manitoba project we are watching received a $350,000 grant from FCM. Similarly, Alberta Innovates has granted $300,000 for a biobattery waste energy technology from Germany. And as we saw, Surrey received a 25% grant from the federal government. We are actively looking at grant opportunities for this type of work and initiatives. At the same time, it's no secret traditional municipal revenue sources such as grants are at risk of declining and all municipalities are competing for the same limited funds. We are doing our models on the basis that it has to be self-sustainable without funding from other levels of government as subsidization dependence on other levels of government may not be sustainable in the future and at the end of the day it's still our own personal tax dollars it is just that we have given these dollars to other levels of government. This said, if we can prove viability without grants, we certainly wouldn't turn down any grants we are eligible to receive as long as they're not needed to keep the initiative a going concern. So with all this said, there's still much work to do in a very short time frame to report to Council in March. But I'm very proud of the, the administration team that was formed in the spring to tackle this. They are committed, engaged, and diligent, and I look forward to the outcomes of their work. At this point, no particular technology has been selected to recommend to Council yet. We are evaluating different technologies and their applicability to meeting our needs as set out in the objectives. No decisions have been made about which waste streams we generate would go into the waste energy process and which waste streams would not. Anything at this point would be speculation and premature. As per the original notice of motion made by Councillor Hughes on the topic back in January 2017, we have been looking at and continue to look at ancillary processes. Each ancillary process in itself is a separate presentation, so we're not going to get into that much detail today. But at the highest level, the principles of integrating other technologies with zero waste is to capitalize on the synergies between them to realize additional benefits from each technology not available if they are employed in isolation. Again, it is looking at this as one plus one does not equal two, but it equals something more than two with the compounded benefits realized from integrating. We will also be looking at every available green energy source for feasibility of integration. So at the end of the day, in the future, we may end up with a, sust a new sustainable cross-section in our future developments. If you can imagine district energy pipes installed under sidewalks. In those pipes treated effluent, conserving water, is carrying green energy from zero waste and other green energy sources. Not only does the energy in the pipes heat homes and businesses, but it keeps the sidewalks clear of ice if we want to get more into social sustainability and talk about accessibility. The sidewalk itself will contain ash and glass from the zero waste process to keep the costs of concrete and sidewalk replacement down. That is the kind of thinking going into this initiative, but it requires a yes if, not no because mindset from everybody. If that happens, even better opportunities than what we are talking about today will materialize through collaboration. So what are, we going to, what are we going, so where are we going on this in the next while? How does this all fit together? The Scandinavian countries have been leaders in sustainability practices and industrial ecosystems for years with integrated utilization of byproducts and waste products from one party by another. This industrial ecosystem presented really does not look that different from some of the opportunities present in St. Albert and our adjoining neighbours that we've been discussing this evening. 
Whether you are a resident that owns a home in St. Albert as I am, or whether you rent, whether you are a business owner currently, or looking to invest in a new business in St. Albert, whether you are a not-for-profit that pays taxes and or utilities, this is in all of our interests. And what we do or don't do is important to the rest of the world as a member of the global community. So we are taking the industrial ecosystem to the next level with a collaborative ecosystem which is working together as a community, regardless of sector, eliminating traditional barriers and stereotypes to achieve common goals. And the entire system or network or an ecosystem needs to be looked at with the compounding effects they produce instead of solitary processes or issues with narrow-minded narrow outcomes. Objectivity is required to, to, to develop solutions and outcomes without prejudice and predetermined outcomes when the work is yet to be done. There can still be significant evolutions and revolutions in ideas, particularly when the other sectors in the community are engaged before final recommendations are presented to Council in March. And the only certainty in our future is that we cannot keep doing the things we are, the way we are. It's unsustainable and there is no better evidence than tonight's report on a recycling situation. So in the end, this is a very complex issue with very technical details, which we have not delved into here tonight. We have lots of good people in the community that can tackle this with us, and we look forward to that. And in the end, this is about economic growth and long-term sustainability to benefit all in St. Albert in the absence of other viable alternatives while doing our part for the global community that we are part of. It's about our future as a community. We will be posting this presentation and further information on an alternative uh, servicing initiative website we're setting up over the next day or two. And as new information becomes available, we'll be posting it to the City of St. Albert website and social media accounts. So watch for our tweets on them. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Scoble. And thank you to Mr. Cole and Ms. Clock for coming. Um, we have lo lots to think about. We've had one presentation that talks about uh, some of the issues that we are um, faced with, the, the real possibility that our diversion is just going to uh, uh, increase and not get better. We have uh, another presentation that talked about the solutions around waste diversion um, and sustainability for our community. So with that, we are going to be going outside shortly. Everybody needs a break. We're going to, I'm going to ask that you think about your questions. Uh, we're going to come back from the candlelight vigil. We're going to have a conversation around changes in recycling and the future going forward.